I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello, and welcome to another week of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cortright, and I am here with the super recharged millennial, David Barreto. How you doing, Big Dave? I'm doing good. I wasn't sure what you were going to say. Uh, nothing bad. <laughs> this week, our topic is connection. Today's Motivational Monday. We're going to talk about what it is to have an awakening with the eye of presence. Tuesday's Health Huddles, diet, the first step to connection. Wednesday's Meeting of the Minds. We're going to discuss the want energy on connection. Thursday, we will talk about the connection, the connecting to silence. That'll be fun. And guess what? New book on Friday. Are you ready? I'm ready. We will start a new book study, Emotional Wellness by Osho. <laughs> Why new book not? For me. Why not? You're going to love Osho. You're going to love it. But that's a pretty deep book for this little show. But hey, <laughs> it's where we're setting now. So this week, we're going to talk and have a discussion on how we can connect and what I want to talk about is I'd like to kick off with the understanding of the heart connection and the eye of presence. So we started a little bit with that last week, if you remember, as we ended the week. The definition of connection is the relationship in which a person, thing, or idea is linked or associated with something else. Connection. So we can have connection with another person. We can have connection with a network. We can have connection to the internet. And I laugh because you've been fixing my internet connection all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> or we cannot have connection to the internet, you know. But the connection I would like to discuss today and this week is the connection to ourself. That's the connection I'm looking to discuss. So most of us have little experience or knowledge of what it is to connect to ourself. We identify with ourselves from the I of identification. In other words, we believe we are connected and we have free will. We actually have that belief, but we are acting out of the ego. Mm -hmm. We don't act of our own accord, but we believe we are. That's the key word. We believe we are. We live in an age of information overload. Our phones, internet, and televisions flood our senses. Researchers, and this is something we learned from Dave Conley, researchers carefully craft all the advertisements we watch, all the messages we receive to prime us to think certain thoughts so we will take certain actions. That's their job. They use the law of mind to control you. A particular color, a special tone of voice, a slight gesture with the right celebrity or picture will stimulate your imagination. With our imagination painted, we get feelings that produce thoughts. Man, if I buy that cologne, I can be cool like Johnny Depp. <laughs> See the commercial? I go, he's like 55 years old. I'm going to have to link that commercial. I think it's been you know it's commercial, like five right? times But you know it, right? Yeah. It's Johnny Depp commercial. Because every time he does that damn cologne commercial, I think there's a new movie coming out. Uh, I haven't bought the cologne yet, just so you know. Or have I? I was just about to say. <laughs> so we fool ourselves with... Uh, one of the things is we like to fool ourselves with social media that we are actually connected. People actually think they're connected because they're on social media. We share everything from pictures of our family to the last meal we cooked. But this is not true connection. It's connection of identification or ego. It's not our self. So sending out that daily status update makes us feel a certain kind of security of who we are. Shows people that we are living the good life. That's the big thing we want to put out there. Especially the excitement of validation when we get a like. <laughs> My God, how many likes did you get on this? See, everybody gets all excited. Tweets, how many retweets? It's all, everybody gets so excited over that stuff. And this social media validation is not connection. The constant outward search to belong, the seeking to be approved is actually pushing, pushing us further and further away from true connection. It is leaving us feeling empty. 
kind of like confused. I don't know if that's the word I would use, but empty, you know, like there's got to be more. There's got to be more to this. How many Facebook likes do you have? How many fans do you have? You know, so we attempt to fill this emptiness with food, drugs, alcohol, and more social media. <laughs> Would you agree with me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so if we are feeling empty, that is actually a good thing. That's what I believe anyways. I believe if you're feeling empty, it's a good thing. It means that you are disconnected and this realization that you have this emptiness really begins your true search. So we talked last week about the eye of identification. This is when we are connected to the head and the self-image, the programs, the cage, the ego. When we are in the head, we see everybody and everything through a concept. And it's a concept of beliefs. It's a cage. So people say, well, I know Joe. You don't know Joe. You have a concept of who you believe Joe is. You understand? We don't know him. Does that, does that, does that make sense to you? Well, I think just when you look at anybody and like if I say, oh yeah, I know Bill or it, it changes literally from person to person. It will never be the same from anybody. There because may be small a, pieces. Absolutely, yes. Because but it, literally every single person, parent, mother, grandparent, business partners, everyone will have a different concept of who Bill is, who David is. And, you know, like right now, you guys, oh, you guys are podcasters. Are we just podcasters? Exactly. Because it's all concepts, yeah. right? They think, and people, man, they get, they get really, oh, I know him. Oh, you really don't know him. But there's concepts. Now, when we are connected to the eye of presence, we are then connected to the heart. And the main thing is when you're connected to the heart is, is you're in the moment. That's it. So then you can really see someone or something. There's no voice in your head telling you what you see. You are present. So one of the things I do and one of the tricks I learned from Eckhart Tolle is when I coach, you'll notice I have that, that bar on my chair and I try to feel my feet or if I'm standing, because sometimes I coach standing, I want to feel my feet. And it's kind of cool because I always think of the soles. That's what I think of the soles of my feet. But the reason I do that is so I can hear the person talk to me and I can be there instead of having a concept of how to answer and fix them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, you're really just trying to... Anytime I have a conversation with somebody when it's more than just, you know, back and forth, just chatter and stuff like that, if somebody's really trying to get my opinion or, like, my actual thoughts or feelings towards something, I try to, like like you said, ground myself. You know, yes. I always notice I'm either moving my fingers together or, like, I'm yeah. touching my jeans. And it's not because I'm, like, distracted. It's, like, it's... Focusing, keeping my body focused on that so I can keep my mind present on what they're saying. So you don't have the voice in your head. There's no Nelson. There's no Barry in your heads and that. And that's really what we talk about when you have the eye of presence. Now, when we talk about states that we live in, right? And we talked a little bit about that, that nothing can rise higher than its source. And we're the source. And our state is and what determines our source. Well, when we have an awakening, Waking up is when we begin to connect to the heart and the eye of presence. But much of this waking up is when parts of the eye of identification die. In other words, they break off. They're removed. They're like a computer anyway. So it's like you've taken the programs out. Because remember, all identification is in the head. It's not in the heart. So that's your programs, that's your beliefs, your concepts, right? So part of the awakening process, and that's what I want to talk about today, is that's going to create a different type of connection because it's not you trying to be connected. It's because you have less voice in your head. So guess what? You're more connected. And so I'm going to bring in another Kevin story. So everybody, if you're a new listener, has been following Kevin's progress for about a year now, right? Some of you might just know him as Bobby. Well, that's his ego. His ego is Bobby. But now I want to bring in another part of the story. So we know that Kevin has struggled in setting goals and accomplishing basically you anything. <laughs> because it's true, you know? And Kevin will be the first to tell you it's true, right? 
Oh, yeah. So he's not going to lie. He'll say, yeah, I just don't follow through and do anything. And he's never done it. He never follows through. And so Kevin is now training for his first bodybuilding contest. And I'm the lucky one that gets to coach him. So about a month ago, you know, we're working on some stuff and we talked about it. He cheated a couple of times on his diet. Cornbread. Took a cheat day he wasn't supposed to take. And what frustrated me was that I was working on his diet and trying to help him. And I couldn't figure out why he wasn't moving forward. And he forgot to mention, oh, by the way, I'm cheating on my diet. That's why I'm not moving forward. Cornbread isn't a part of a it's diet. Not, it's not a vegetable. No. <laughs> Just so you know, cornbread is not a vegetable. So. I've been living a lie. A couple of weeks ago, I got to tell you the next story. And I don't even know if I told you this story yet of what happened. So a couple of weeks ago, him and I are training legs together. And he's doing a set. And we go, we train legs hard, as you know. And. He's, he has a certain number of repetitions he has to hit. And with two reps left, he stops and he racks the bar. Now I'm spotting him and going, what are you doing? I told you this many reps. Why are you racking the bar? And he kind of, you know, complained. You know, it was hard. It was this. He complained. So went on. I did my set. He does another set. And this time with three reps left, I'm telling you, David, he had fear in his face because he either didn't trust me I could spot him and I was pushing him to exhaustion and he's got, let's be honest, he's got 350 pounds on his back, right? But I've done this for a few decades. <laughs> I know how to spot you. I'm not going to let nothing happen. But he literally ran away and the funny thing is I could see the fear in his face while he racked the weight. So you've been with me long enough, right? So <laughs> about that time, I snap. And... I just tell him, and I start telling him, listen, why don't? Why are you doing this? Why do you have to compete in a contest? We all agreed. Why is he doing this? He's not going to be a pro bodybuilder, right? He's not going to ever do anything like that. He's a family man with a job, with two kids, and he's been working out very good for over a year now, right? Why do you want to do this? And then he starts yelling at me. Oh, my. So... He starts yelling at me how he can't do this. And, you know, what am I supposed to do when I can't do it? And I just went in the middle of the gym. Now, it's a damn good thing we work out at 3.34 in the morning. Because at my full voice, I told him, be quiet. And he kept talking. I go, be quiet. Finally, he kept talking. I go, shut up. But it wasn't a few words with it. You know, at three in the morning, that is extremely loud. <laughs> <laughs> it echoes in the gym uh, for the five people who are there. And I felt sorry. You know, the one girl that always works yeah. out there. I apologize to her, but I just snapped on him. And I just, and I tell him, and every time he opened his mouth, I go, shut it. Shut up. You know, so I finally, he shut up. And I told him, I go, why don't you just quit? And so in the seals, they have you ring the bell, right? I go, ring the bell, walk out the door, go home, and tomorrow come back and we'll train like regular people again. I'm cool with it. I'm not telling you I won't work out with you. I'm telling you, quit. You don't want to do this competition. And so he's sitting there on the bench, and I am just ripping him now. And I'm telling him, you know, go ring the bell. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I can kind of, I can kind of be, um, Kind of hawking, is that the word? And I go, extreme. Extreme. And so you go ring the bell. It's okay. We'll go back to our regular workouts. You know, fine. Just quit. Walk out the door and quit. Walk out the door and quit. Quit. You can't do it. You don't have it. You don't have it. Leave. Go. You don't got what it takes. You ain't got the guts. You ain't got the fortitude to do this. Quit. So I'm rifling on him, right? And he sat there and I could see he was ready to quit. How I knew was he started pulling his wraps, his wrist wraps off. And he started putting things in his bag. And I could see that he was getting ready to walk out the door. And I, so I did my set. I went, I'm doing my workout. I did my set and I came back and he was sitting there and I told him that, you know, when you walk out the door, it's over. Don't worry about it. It's done. You don't have, you don't have no more diet, no more yelling at you, no more pressure. You're done. Walk out the door. And I did another set. And then I looked at him and I asked him, I go, what are you doing? Leave, go. And I saw something. And here's where I saw the eye split. 
And this isn't a miraculous thing. I don't know if you've ever seen it in coaching or things like that. When you have the eye split, that means for that moment, Kevin didn't know who he was. So he's always been at Bobby's. His ego has always been this quitter and good guy, jolly, jovial, right? You're laughing because it's jolly. true, right? But he is, right? He's just a good man. He really is a good man. But I saw the eye split. And, and he, because Bobby had been always a quitter, he wanted to walk out. But for some reason, he couldn't. And he had confusion on his face like he didn't know who he was. Literally saw the most confused look. You know, and it was like out of nowhere. He goes, no, I'm doing this. And he rose up and he, and he rose up and there's utter, David, there's utter confusion on his face. He really doesn't know what he's doing. Why am I doing this? And he said, no, I'm finishing. I'm doing it. I'm going to tell you from that moment on, and this has been a couple weeks now, he, Kevin has been disciplined. He went on, he went for your brother's birthday, right? He didn't cheat. Nope, not at all. What would have happened in the past? There ain't no way he could have went to Miami and not cheated. No way. Don't tell Bill. Yeah, that's it. He, yeah, don't tell Bill is what he would have said. But he's been disciplined. And you want to know something? Last week, he was strongest I've ever seen him in the gym. His strength is up. I've seen him. And it was, it was this moment that he had, this awakening, that everything changed. So now when he texts me or something, he says he's going to do something, I believe him. I've never believed him before. And that is an awakening. And what happened was a piece of his ego named Bobby died. You know? So this piece, so he can travel to a party and don't cheat on his diet. He completes every rep now, every set, everything changed. Now what changed was his connection. That's what changed. The connection now has been weakened from identification. And if I remove the identification, I change the source. And so remember, nothing can rise higher than your source. That's your state. So if a piece of Bobby, we call him Bobby, right? it breaks off, it changes his state. It changes his source. So now he's completely a different person. And so I, I watched him and and part of Bobby died, which means it won't come back. And this is kind of what they do in the military, by the way. They push you in the military to break everything down so that when you're in emergency, there's no thought anymore. Your identification is gone. You know what to do. You do it without thought. You do it with connection. So he's now... Which changed for him to connect it. He's now connected to the eye of presence. He stopped being afraid and he started being. And this is what's called an awakening. And when you discover, when you have an awakening for the first time, you will discover your true self. And this is what I believe sports do. This is what the military can do. But this is what doing anything hard. When you hear, hear, hear somebody hit rock bottom, what's happened is when they hit rock bottom, the eye of identification has broken off and the eye of heart and presence rises up and they rise out of the ashes like a phoenix. That's connection. So when we talk about this connection, I want to talk a little bit of understanding that true connection is connection to the heart. And that always starts with purpose. We talked about it last week. So how can we, anything you want to put into the Bobby, or the Kevin story, I can't call him Bobby anymore. I actually got to call him Kevin. Still Bobby. He's still Bobby to you? He's still Bobby. You still want to see more? Oh, no, no, no. He's Bobby because of the haircut. Everybody, <laughs> email me if you want to see the haircut. <laughs> That's why he's Bobby. <laughs> I I love Kevin. You know that, right? I really do. That poor guy. But I'll tell you what. Here's why. By the way, so Linda asked me, for those listeners, that's my wife. And this is her son-in-law, right? And he asked me. Why is he doing this? And I told her, I go, do you realize that if he does this and actually finishes it and competes, I don't care where he places. What he has done is he's proven to himself that he can do something to the extreme and accomplish it. That means he can do anything. That means if he wants to go take a course in school, man, when you diet down to 3% body fat, you can take a course in school. You could do, uh, am I right though? Your coach told you that, didn't he? 
Yeah, you yeah. when the the reason why like I I plan on doing it and it's the same reason why Kevin wants to do it. It's to tell yourself I'm going to do something that is impossible to 99% of the people. Yep. And it's impossible to myself until I believe it's possible and it's doing whatever it takes with the end goal of saying I know I can. And like we said in in past episodes your perception is your reality. So if I'm changing what I'm thinking is possible, then I can do that with anything else. It's just a That's small stepping stone. That's why you do it. So we hear Dan Walsh running 100 miles. We heard uh, how Bruce Van Horn came up and ran marathons, right? So I knew when I became a bodybuilder, I could do anything. Losing the weight, I lost 123 pounds, but I lost 100 pounds twice before that. But becoming a bodybuilder? Oh my, I can do, and I still carry that today. 30 some years later, I still carry it because what it is, is you tear down the restraints of the eye of identification. That tells you, it's the voice in your head telling you can't do it. So when he was racking the weight, it was a voice in his head saying, get this off my back, get this off my back. I'm going to get hurt, get this off my back. If he had stayed present, you don't miss that lift. Yeah, and, and and you said it, and it kind of like goes over a lot of people's head when when he says stuff like this. But he said, "I am going to finish it." Yes. He didn't say Kevin's going to be a bodybuilder. Yep. He didn't nope. say Bobby's not here. Yep. He said, "I am yep. the one that was born." Yep. Was the one that finished the set in the gym. It's the same one that's going to compete. And he's going to do it now. That, now I, I gotta go back. Be- 200 episodes, I said he will not quit. <laughs> yeah, you said it. I tried to drive him out. And, and the reason now, if he had walked out of the gym, you know, I would have said nothing. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have held it against him because so few people can do this. I wouldn't have held it against him. It would have been fine. Okay, so what? Come in and train the next day. But no, now I believe we're going to see him in December on stage. We might have to do a live show from there. Oh boy. We have to, might have to, right? We have to. It's in the keys. We'll have fun yeah. down there. That yeah, will party like it's 1999. No, we won't do that. <laughs> okay. So, true connection is connection to the heart. And that's what happened to Kevin. And he started realizing that he has a purpose for training for this competition now. And his purpose is he wants to prove to himself that he can take something to an extreme and do it. That's why I think the military is great. I love the military because it did things to me I didn't even think were possible. (laughs) And when you can do those things, the rest of your life seems easy. I don't know. Little things that would drive other people crazy don't break you because you've accomplished that. So how can we awaken our connection to the heart? Well, number one, and I said it last week, you must find your purpose and your values. If you don't know your purpose, like I know my purpose is energy. And so that's my true purpose. So I know my pendulum. My purpose pendulum is when I'm connected to energy, my heart is open. When I feel stagnated, then it's burying the head, right? For you, when you feel inspiration, your heart is open. When you feel apathy or depressed, then you know it's Nelson in the head, you know? So you got to find that. You got to know it because... It's not something you just set. It's actually something you discover. So we did an interview last week with Monty. Monty had um, a mentor that was teaching him how to find his purpose. <laughs> and he's for weeks, Monty would call him and say, is this my purpose? He goes, no, and laugh at him. <laughs> you know, because you have to discover it. You just don't set it. So number one, find your purpose and values. Number two, I think it's important to practice gratitude. The reason is the tools of the heart. Remember, awakening is about connecting to the eye of presence, which is the heart. And the tools of the heart are imagination, very important, because it works with the law of mind, which you imagine you become, which causes the feelings that you attract and the thoughts, what you think you create. So it's imagination, but it's also faith, That's how I have to get through my stagnated periods, plateaus, faith that what I'm doing is working, even though that the outside evidence might not be there. And it's gratitude. Giving thanks that you already have done something before you've ever done it. That is the heart. That is important. That's going to be a key if you're an entrepreneur, by the way. There's so many times where I'm just like, you know what? I'm done. This has not done a single thing. And then all of a sudden it takes off. Yeah, every time. I was like, if I would have stopped literally a day 
early, nothing would have happened. Well, see, you're a young entrepreneur, so I've seen this happen for, for 30 years, and, and it's exactly like you said. It seems like right when you're about to quit, it starts to happen. Oh, that God has such a humor. Such a sense of humor that substance has, huh? So, number three is accept and stop fighting your past. See, the past is gone. And what happens when people are always kind of focused on what happened in the past, they build resentment. And that is just weight that you carry in the cage. That makes the eye of identification in the head stronger. You're just carrying it with you. You're carrying your problems from the past that don't exist anymore, and you're carrying them into the future. So it's like you're pulling, we talk about pulling, the climbing, the mountain climbers, the, uh, mountain climbers, in a climber community, it's like you're climbing the mountain with a 50 pound cage dragging behind you. And every time, you do. so accept and stop fighting your past. Number four, open your heart. That's meditation. That quiet time. The Green Focus Power Hour has meditation built in it for a reason. And number five is interesting. Spend time in nature. One of the things that I'm finding that Rockefeller did, John D. Rockefeller, one of his habits that he created was he realized he was more successful when he stopped forcing things. So one of the things he would do is three days a week, he would work from home, but he would work in his garden. He says some of his best ideas came while he was in his garden because he just got into nature and he shut off. Number six, to awaken, travel. Would you agree with me on that one? Oh, yeah. Travel. Go out there. I got uh, one of our, our listeners is getting ready to travel to Argentina. He's a young man. He's getting ready to travel to Argentina, and I think it's wonderful for him. He's nervous. Of course you're nervous. I'll give a shout out to Ali. Ali, go get him, buddy, because you're going to love Argentina. And But he's nervous. And But I'm telling you, our... Linda, my kid, they travel, right? You come back with a fire lit under you. Yeah, you, because... You know what? You get to experience it, and then when you want to keep on doing it, yep. you have to do the things you don't want to do so you can go back and well, experience you know your, those things. You know what your mom taught me was that, you know, I always thought success was things. And she taught me about eight years ago. She changed my life. She goes, no, success ain't things. It's experiences. And that's the way your mom lived. That's with the travel and all that stuff. I love that stuff because she's right. I never knew how to take a vacation. She had to teach me. Now we travel. I think we're going to Amsterdam, by the way, at the end of the month. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Oh, I know you know that. But <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I, just so you know, I'm going to be leaving. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. With, with my car, a lot of people call me materialistic because it's you, a fancy car. You love that car. Man. Because I've all my friends are from car shows, car mm -hmm. meets. The the amount of hours I've spent in the garage with people like banging our heads against the wall trying to figure out how this works and this works and those are the things I remember. I don't remember like the amount of money I spent on a certain part. I remember like it's the your, hours I've shared your, with But it's people. your yeah, it's your shut off. Now, that's number 7. Do what you love. You love that car. Does it mean that you know that it, it, so Rockefeller had his garden. You have your car. What's my what is my hobby? I guess my hobby would be I read a lot. I read a lot. I love reading. You I know? think you actually have a hobby for YouTube. Do I? I love YouTube. I like learning stuff. So number seven, number eight. This is an important one. If you want connection, declutter. Clutter will will get the heart all messed up. Number nine is one, what we have to give Kevin his props. You are the hardest one on Kevin, not me. You got to give him his props. But you set a challenge outside your spectrum. In other words, nobody in the world believes you can do it, not even yourself. And you go out and do it. So this could be physical, run a marathon, compete in a competition, do a hundred mile race. It could be mental. It could be, I know, like Mark Middlestead went back to school and got a degree in his 50s. Sandy took her first course. Sandy Sleck took her first course at 50. Go back to school. Do something that you didn't think you'd ever do. You know what I mean? Just to do it. To stretch your... Get outside and challenge yourself outside your spectrum. Or one of the things I can't wait to do is a silent retreat. I want to go away for a week and not talk. How does that sound? Tell me where to book your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and number 10, as my young millennial uh, pounds me, is really practice the steps of stress mastery. Because I'm telling you, those steps are designed to flip the eye of identification on its ass and flip the eye of presence 
and it's light. That's what those steps do. That's it for today's show. Our mission here at the Stress Mastery Podcast is to create a whole lot of shift. And we're going to create a shift in this planet. You can join us by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below the show. All right, super. Let's get out of here. As always, until next time, stay inspired. inspired.